So you guys have had plenty of time to find the book of Amos. If you haven't, it's in the Old Testament towards the the end of the Old Testament, like right before we get to the New Testament. We've, we're going through a sermon series on um, the minor prophets. And the minor prophets are not minor because their, their message is minor. In fact, their message is really deep. It's, it's got a lot to say. They are minor because they're small books. And because they were small books, a lot of times they were included in one scroll, like the book of the 12. It would be just one scroll that had all 12 minor prophets because they're short. Amos is not the shortest prophet. It has nine chapters in there. So it's going to take us at least two weeks to get through it. Now, since I set a goal for two weeks, that means it's probably going to take us four. four. No, it's not going to take me that long. But we're going, to, we're going to go through Amos. And if you open up to the first chapter of Amos, we're going to cover the first five chapters. And Amos has a lot to say. And he's not exactly the guy that you would think would be saying it. And so let's just look at the first two verses of Amos chapter 1. It says, The word of Amos, one of the shepherds of Toka, the vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and Jeroboam, son of Joash, was king of Israel. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders in Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. And so there's the beginning, the opening to the book of Amos. I just want you to know the word Amos, the name means a burden or a load. And so this, this man has a load on his back, right? He's, he's got a burden that he's got to, to deliver. He is a prophet who's sent to preach to the people of Israel. And as we've gone through the minor prophets, you know that the people of Israel are broken into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom is Israel, the southern kingdom is Judah. And like Hosea, Amos' message is primarily, although not exclusively, to the people of Israel. And he's writing during a time that Israel had um, prosperity, right? Things were going really well in Israel. And so when things are going good and you you offer a message of rebuke, people don't often want to listen to you, right? Like God might be angry with you, but you would say, no, God's not angry at, it, at us. Look at our economy. Look, our borders are strong. We have a good military. We have a good king. Like, Israel's great. And uh, Amos is saying, no, it's not. You have some problems. And you have to fix these problems. And so his message was one that wasn't accepted. It was, it was a load that, that uh, he was bearing. And Amos is not actually from Israel. Amos is from Judah. So he's coming across the border to share this message. Now, on top of the the audience, you have Israel. The person Amos is uh, not exactly who you would expect to be delivering a message. He is a shepherd, right? Anybody really think that if God's going to bring a message to you, he's going to use a shepherd? Well, if you know scripture, you know the answer would be probably so, right? God uses the weak to shame the strong, but most of the time you would think prophets are going to be someone that was educated in becoming a prophet or a priest, somebody who knew the scriptures well. And Amos does know the scriptures well, but he's just a shepherd, right? And I think there's a beautiful message that God is going to use just a shepherd to deliver a message to the people of Israel. Because I think a lot of times we think, well, we're not good enough to deliver this message, right? Because God has commissioned us to go and to preach the gospel. And you might be thinking, I can't do it. I don't know enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not in the right position to do it. And I just want to remind you that God put a load on Amos. He he gave him a message that was going to be difficult for him to preach. And Amos was just a shepherd. And so, don't let whatever it is you, that, that you believe about yourself, that you're not good enough, hold you back from delivering God's message because God has a message to deliver to people through you, right? And so we're going to get into the book of Amos, and, and he gives the time. We know it's time of prosperity. We know what his message is, and we know the people he's writing to. He's writing to the people of Israel. And his first message, his first vision, is a vision of the Lord who roars from Zion. So I want you to get that vision in your mind. God is this lion who is roaring from Zion. This would have rubbed Israel a little bit in the wrong way because they were the northern kingdom and Zion is in the southern kingdom, right? And so Amos is is putting this idea off at first that God is dwelling in Zion. He's thundering from Jerusalem and the people of Israel might get a little bit frustrated here. But as we consider God roaring from Zion, I was thinking about a lion, and, and tell me, when do lions roar? Right 
when they're tired, when they're hungry, when they're about ready to pounce, right? You don't see a lion roaring whenever he's stalking his prey. In fact, he's very, very quiet. He's stalking the prey. No, the lion roars when he's ready to pounce. And and, and what Amos is telling us is that God is ready to pounce. He's roaring. He's ready to pounce on people. And I began to think, what is it that causes God to roar? When we look at at what kind of things will cause God to pounce, to judge. We we talked about justice a little bit in the beginning, and uh, we had some good ideas on what justice is. But I think when people act in ways that are unjust or unjust, when they oppress the poor, when they treat people as if they don't matter, when they disregard life, those are things that make God roar. Would you agree? When people disregard life, God gets angry. And justice has to do with giving people what they deserve. God is going to bring justice. He's going to make things right. And so we want justice, right? We want God to to act justly as long as God is acting justly on them over there, right? We want them to get what they deserve. And over here, we want mercy, right? That's what we want. We want mercy. But sometimes we can't always have it both ways. So we have to live justly if we want God to show us mercy, right? We can't treat people in ways that oppress them if we want God to show us compassion, can we? See, you get, you get what you deserve. And so Jesus will pick up on this and say, if... if uh, you want mercy, you show mercy. If you want forgiveness, you forgive. If you judge, you will too also be judged. It's the measure that we, we pour out that is measured back to us. And so when we decide we want justice for others, we better take a step back and realize that might be what we get in return. So instead, maybe we should be treating people with mercy, understanding that when we're merciful, God's going to be merciful to us. And so now we're going to go on to the judgments that that. Amos is going to tell us about. And I was reading through Amos this week and I thought, wow, what a gruesome book. There's like a lot of things in here that I don't like to read. I don't want to see. And, and so it was kind of, it's kind of hard going through it. But once I, once I started picking it apart, I found that God is both a God of mercy and a God of justice. And so we're going to look at, at my first point, which is God judges the nations, right? God judges the nations, the roar of judgment on all the nations. And this is going to take us from verse 3 all the way through chapter 2. But these are going to be different judgments that God pours out. And there's a formula that you're going to see as as we read these judgments. It starts by who's pronouncing the judgment. This is what the Lord says. Look at verse 3. This is what the Lord says. And then it talks about the, the people who are being judged. So for instance, it, the first judgment goes against Damascus. So verse 3 says, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. And so it's this poetic way of saying, I'm going to punish and I'm not going to hold my, myself back from judgment. Because of their sin, I won't be bargained with. You can't, you, you can't bargain your way out of this one. I'm going to judge. And for three sins, even for four I'm, of Damascus, I will not relent. And then it'll describe what the people's sin is, right? So for instance, Damascus, she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. And then it pronounces judgment. In verse four, I will send fire on the house of Hazel that will consume the fortress of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gates of Damascus, and I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon. The one who holds the scepter of beth Aden. the people of Aram, will go into exile. So that's the structure of these judgments. God pronounces the judgments on the people. He gives the reason why they're being judged, and then he says what he's going to do. And in every case, except for with Israel, the judgment's going to involve fire. Why? Because our God is consuming fire. Right? And so I want you to see the kinds of things that make God roar. I want you to see the kinds of things that make God angry and pour out his judgments. The first thing that makes God roar when we're talking about Damascus has to do with human cruelty. 
right? See, I have, I have this idea that the one thing that makes God really angry is when we disregard human life. That's one thing that makes God angrier than anything. I would say God is very much pro-life. But every element of life, not just one part of it. See, he gets angry with Damascus because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. These sledges are like these large boards and they're, they're rolled across the ground. And they have iron underneath them. And the purpose of them is to um, thresh wheat. And it would crush the, the wheat stock and it would break it open. It was a farming machine. But Damascus put people underneath these things. They treated their prisoners of war with cruelty. They ran people over with iron sledges. Now, I don't want to get too gruesome because I don't think we have to get any more gruesome than what Amos is telling us. But what does God think when you treat people with such contempt, with such cruelty? that you're actually going to torture them. See, I think God gets really angry, right? And he pours out his judgment. And, and here's what I want you to see. Damascus is not Israel. Damascus is a nation that surrounds Israel. And so when, when Amos gave this message, the people of Israel would probably clap and say, that's right, that's what the people of Damascus deserve. They're cruel. They run people over with iron sledges. And don't you think that they're going to get just what they deserve? That's justice, right? And, and so they, the people of Israel were probably happy about this first judgment because it concerned them over there. These people acted in ways that are inhumane. They tortured and killed people. They deserve punishment. And so they, they get excited about that. Yeah, let's, let's pour out judgment on them. And so God does. He sends his fire and, and he does that. The next judgment comes in verse 6. It says, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent. This is another neighboring nation of Israel, right? It's not Israel itself. And so the people of Israel are probably going to clap at this one too. We're really excited about this judgment because this involves our neighbors over there and we want our neighbors to get what they deserve, right? And look at what they do because what they do is awful, but it's something that still happens today. It says, for three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. This was a, a nation that was involved in a slave trade. They would take whole communities captive and sell them to something else, another community, the, the country of Edom, right? And what do you think God does when he sees people involved in slave trade? He roars. He gets angry because I believe God has a regard for human life, whether it's the way in which you put people to death or the fact that you're selling people into slavery. God is very much pro-life. And when you disregard life, to the point you're going to sell them to another community? My God roars. My God gets angry. And we, we might celebrate that because we want to see justice. We want to see those people that oppressed the, 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 the people and sold them off into slavery. We want to see them get what they deserve. Right? And so they get it. Verse 7 says, I will send my fire on the walls of Gaza. God's going to judge these people too, right? Because God very much cares about the sanctity of life. The next group is just like the group before it. This one is the, the nation of Tyre. In verse 9 it says, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not relent because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding a treaty of brotherhood. Right? Another thing that makes God angry, but this has two parts to it. Not only are they selling communities into slavery, but they also disregarded a treaty that they had made. See, God also cares that people stay true to their word. And this nation didn't. And I want you to see that Israel is probably clapping for this one too. Right? Because Amos is going into the people of Israel and he's talking about all their neighbors. He hasn't quite got to Israel yet. And he's saying, those people over there, they treat people cruelly. 
They run them over with threshing sledges. Those people over there, they sell people in, in human trafficking. God, we want justice for that. This next nation also does human trafficking, but they also break their treaties. They're not people of their word. And so you see the people of Israel clapping again and saying, yes, they're getting what they deserve, right? And I think I would be right there with them because as we look at how God is judging the nations, these people deserve judgment, right? And so God judges Tyre too. He says, I will send my fire on the walls of Tyre. See, God is a consuming fire. He's going to judge Tyre as well. And now in verse 11, we get to Edom. And we've already talked about Edom twice because they're the ones that are, are buying these slaves. So we think, okay, these guys really need justice. But here's what it says. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not relent because he pursued his brother with a sword and slaughtered the women of the land because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked. See, I thought he was going to talk about slavery with Edom, but he lists a different sin that God is going to punish them for. We know the people of Edom because these are the, the children of Esau. And, and Israel is the children of Jacob. And did those two ever get along? No, they were fighting their way out of the womb, right? If you, if you remember the story, they were fighting their way out of the womb. But Edom hated their brother. I mean, really think about that. Edom pursued his brother with a sword. He hated his brother. Why? Because those people over there, they're, they're children of Jacob. For no other reason except for they're children of Jacob. You ever like think about like how awful people can be with their stereotypes and the way that they, they look at people and they say, I can't like you because you are children of Jacob. Or, or pick your label. I can't like you because whatever label. Right? But here is God, and he's saying that he cares about every life because everybody was created in the image of God. We are image bearers. Whether you're a child of Esau or a child of Jacob, you were created with value. And the children of Edom had no value for the children of Jacob. God is going to punish them because they don't care about the sanctity of human life. Not just at, at, at one point, but all the way up to this point. You disregard people just because they are a child of this one. Whatever label. And, and so we, we see in that this idea we want to get rid of, of these type of people. And because of that, God is going to send his fire on, on Timon. The next judgment goes off against Amen. For Amen. Amen. This is what verse 13 says. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Amen, even for four I will not relent, because he ripped open pregnant women in Gilead in order to extend its borders, and I will set fire to the walls. So when I say God cares about the sanctity of human life, it starts here. Right? I mean, we've seen it throughout every one of these judgments. He cared when you disregarded the, the prisoners of war and treated them harshly and tortured them and killed them with the threshing sledge. He cared when you sold people off to slavery. He cared when you hated your brother, but he also cares here when you rip open the pregnant woman in order for her to not have any children, right? Like this is so that they could grow their own borders, this has to do with eth ethnic cleansing. They want to they grow their own borders and make sure that those people just go away. And in order to do that, you have to kill their, their, their children even. Right? You want to talk about something that makes God roar. It's when you disregard human life at any point. God gets angry. God gets mad. He roars because you treat humans as if they're less than human. Right? He gets mad at them too. And then in chapter 2, he gets mad at Moab. He says, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not relent, because he burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king. And so I will set fire on Moab. Isn't it interesting? This sanctity of life comes from the very beginning to even 
after the person is dead, you've burned his bones in a way that you could shame him. See, God cares about the whole person, not at just any one point. He cares about the whole person person. And these people had burned the ashes, the bones of a king that had died. They dishonored even the dead. And so because of that, God is roaring from Zion. He's angry and he's going to judge these nations. And I want you to see that in every one of these nations, Israel is celebrating it. Because this isn't a judgment that goes to them. This is a judgment that goes on them over there. My neighbors. You get what you deserve, right? But what does Israel want? Mercy, right? And isn't that how it works? I mean, it's easy for us to look at all the sins that surround us, all the sins that, that those people over there, that's what they're like. And they should get exactly what they deserve, what's due to them. And, and we're over here wanting mercy for us, right? And I think as... as, as uh, Amos is telling the people these judgments. They're celebrating those judgments because, well, it involves them over there. But now, Amos is going to move away from their neighbors and bring it to be a little bit more personal. And I want you to see that in every judgment that follows, that preceded what the judgment we're going to talk about next, these were crimes against humanity. See, those people didn't have the law of Moses to live by. They didn't follow God's decrees. They didn't even believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They followed other gods. So God doesn't judge them based on their disregard for the law. He doesn't even need to. He judges them because of their disregard for human life. That's why he judges them. But when we get to Judah and we get to Israel, we find out that these people are held to even a higher standard than the nations around them. These people were expected to do more, to be better, to, to be a light to, their, to, their, to the nations, a light to those who surrounded them. These people, God expected great things out of them, and yet these people also deserve judgment. But the types of judgment will change because it'll change from judgments against humanity because of crimes of humanity to judgments against God, crimes against God. See, and so in verse four of chapter two, it says, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent. Remember, Judah is God's people, right? These are the people that have the law. They follow Abraham, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob. And in verse four, it says, for, for this, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent because they have rejected the law of the Lord. They have not kept his decrees because they've been led astray by false gods, the gods of their ancestors followed right? This, this thing's changed because now God is pouring out judgments, not because of the way they treated other people or other nations. Now God is pouring out judgment on his own people because they've refused to live like his own people. See, Peter talks about this. He says that judgment starts first in the house of God, right? It's easy for us to look at them out there and, and point our finger and say, we want justice, but we have to take a big look at ourselves first. Judah was a nation that rejected the law of the Lord, right? That's what, that's what God had called them to live by. Judah was a nation that no longer followed the decrees that God put, put, put for them. Judah was a nation that had been led astray by false gods. See, they had, had begun to follow idols. And idolatry became the thing for Judah. And I, I, I know, as I, as I look at our, our nation, right, and I look at our, our people, or even our church, I know that we don't have a, a monopoly of gods out there that we, we worship. But sometimes we have this dull sense of uh, allegiance. And, and we say, yes, we honor God, and we honor Him with our lips, but I wonder if our hearts aren't far from Him because we spend more of our thoughts and more of our concerns and more of our worries on the things of the world than we do on the decrees of God, the law of God, right? And I'm not talking about that Old Testament law. I'm talking about that New Testament law, things like the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus stands on, this, on, on a different mountain and he says, this is how you are to live. I wonder if we've, we've, because of our dual allegiance, we've kind of lost our first love. 
That's what happens to the people of Judah. They, they rejected God. They started following idols. And it's not that God gets jealous. God does get jealous. But something happens when people live a life that has dual allegiance. What happens is their moral compass gets off tilt, right? Because God is supposed to be first and foremost in our life. He's supposed to be number one. And when we put something else first and foremost, all of a sudden what we think is good and evil changes just a little bit. What we're willing to accept is as good and evil changes just a little bit. And, and that's why God needs to be number one. Because unless God's number one, unless God is, is truly God in your life, then the lifestyle you live won't be in keeping with the lifestyle that he demands. And so the people of Judah reject the law. They begin to worship other gods, and God's not okay with that either. And so he says, I will send my fire on Judah. In every one of these judgments, God's sending his fire because he is a consuming fire, right? And it makes God roar when even his own people start to disregard him. And I'm thinking of Israel because, remember, Amos is written to the nation of Israel, and they may be clapping at this judgment too. It's easy to want judgment for all the surrounding nations because look how e evil they are. And then even when you consider Judah, yeah, they're our neighbors. They're not really us, and so we really think they deserve that kind of judgment. But now Amos is going to put the bullseye right on them. See, it's, it's all fun and games when you're talking about the judgment of everyone else, but now Amos says this is what Israel has done wrong. And so we should look at what Israel has done wrong. It says that in verse 6 of chapter 2, it says this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. Why? Because they sell the, inno or they sell the innocent for silver. And the needy for a pair of sandals. Like think of how little value they had on people. The innocent and the needy. They had no value for people. In fact, they, they, they had such little value for people that verse 7 says they trample on the heads of the poor and on the, dust of the, as on the dust of the ground, and they deny justice to the oppressed, right? Now, when we really think about what Israel's doing here, they're treating people in a way that is not fair. See, these people want justice, Right? But in order to, to, to have mercy, you've got to be merciful. These people are treating the poor, the innocent, the needy, as if they're just dust on the ground that they can walk all over. That's, that's not having sanctity of human life. That's not having a high regard for humanity when you treat those who are less than as if they're just something to be walked all over. And that's what's happening in, in Israel. That's not the only thing that's happening in Israel. This next one might get us to, to maybe blush a little bit. But he says, father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. Now, what's happening there is, is idol worship. And in Baal, they had, they had temple prostitutes. And so both the father and the son would go to see the same prostitutes. See, when you, when you begin to have dual allegiances then what you accept as good and evil changes. God would never be okay with this type of lifestyle. But because that God's not number one in their life, these people have become okay with this type of lifestyle. In verse 8, it says, They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. Now, if you don't know what that is, the, the law talks about if, if you, somebody borrows something from you, they can lend you their their outer garment as like a promise that they're going to bring it back. And if this person was poor, that might be the only thing they have to sleep on. That, not as only their, their jacket, but it's also the blanket that they cover themselves up with at night. And so God had told the people, if you, if you take somebody's garment during the day, you must return it during the night. But they had no regard for, for the law. They had no regard for, for or compassion for the people that might be cold. And so they take these garments they don't give them back. In the house of God, they drink wine taken as fines. See, these people have no regard for those that are less than, those who are needy or oppressed. And God had regard for them. See, in verse 9, it says, yet I destroyed the Amorites. See, God took care of them. God destroyed the Amorites before, um, though they were tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. 
I destroyed their fruit above and their roots below. I brought you out of Egypt. See, God had showed kindness to the people of Israel, yet the people of Israel was not showing kindness to those who uh, needed it. And here's the thing that, that I think is, is probably like the icing on the cake. Look at verse 12. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded them not to prophesy. See, what's happening in Israel is that the people are, are treating others as if they don't matter. They're oppressing the poor. They're walking on them as if they're sand on, on, on the ground, just dust on the ground. They don't matter. They have no, no regard for human life. And yet, when somebody speaks out against it, they tell them to shut up. They feed them full of wine and they say, don't prophesy. And that, that to me is, is very, very sad when I think that you see such atrocities going on in the world and the one thing people are telling you is don't talk about them. Paul picks this up. In Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he talks about the message and he says there's going to be a time when people don't really want to hear it. Here's what it says. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For there, are, there time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. This is what's happening in Israel. Israel is treating people as if they don't matter. They have no regard for human life. And if you stand up and say you're wrong, they tell you to shut up. Drink some wine. Don't prophesy. But I want you to know that as, as people, you as a church are commanded to go out and preach. You as a church are commanded to go out and share the gospel. And when we look at what Jesus said the gospel was, he talks about freedom to the oppressed. Now we know that, uh, that the way that freedom is made possible is when he went to the cross and willingly laid down his life for us. See, we were oppressed by sin and Christ died for it. He's our example of how we're supposed to live our life, and he cared about those who were in need. He cared for the least of these, right? The widow who had lost her son and realized that she was not going to be able to take care of herself. Her name would be wiped out in a community. And God, Jesus saw her, and his heart went out to her. Now, Maybe somebody would say, no, don't talk. But I'm telling you, Christian, that you have an obligation to go out and preach the gospel, to be ready in season and out of season, to, to encourage others, to live more like Christ. And as we've just, all we've gone through is two chapters of Amos, and I was supposed to go through five, so. I, I just want you to know that when you look at these two chapters, there's one truth that pops out more than any other. What makes God roar, what makes God angry, is when people do not care about human lives. Whether it's the nations that surround Israel and the awful ways that they treated people, selling them into slavery, ripping babies from stomachs, crushing people under threshing sledges, hatred for their own brother because, well, they're just a brother. They're, they're, they're children of Jacob. Like God roars when people treat others as if their life doesn't matter, no matter what stage of life that is. And that was the problem with Israel. They treated people as if they don't matter because they were poor, less than. And that's not the way God's people have been called to live. I don't know that that makes a very good invitation message but I want to invite you be, to be the church and to stand up for those that are less than. That's my invitation.